Hallelujah. Let's welcome those online tonight. Amen. Glad to have you here. Praise God. God is up to something good, and I love it because you get to be a part. Amen. Um, I've been doing a series of teaching and been kind of hit and miss because a lot of other things have been going on in the church. Uh, and for those that have been trying to watch and we've not been here on Wednesday nights, we've just been having some Holy Ghost moves and uh, we've not been able to go online. But go back and listen to some of the other messages. I know you'll be blessed by them. Again, we're at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, we're speaking on the love chapter. Um, I want to explain to you just a little bit about what's going on here in Corinthians. Um, Paul is dealing with a rebellious people called the church. <laughs> I know that probably ticked some of you off already, but the reality is, is there's a rebellious people in the church. And the reason why they're rebellious is because they're very religious. You have to understand that the Corinthian church came out of legalism. It came out of law. It came out of 613 commandments. And now they're having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ filled with the Holy Spirit and now happen to deal with some fleshly stuff. Anybody here have to deal with any fleshly stuff? And so when you begin to read, thank you, Brother John, when you begin to read uh, Corinthians and you begin to see this fleshly stuff that is going on in their lives, you begin to see that they are under so much bondage that Paul is saying, we've got to straighten this thing out. This thing is not right, and we've got to get it right. When you start reading 1 Corinthians chapter 1 to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you will see that they were having premarital sex. They were drunkards. They were fighting for positions. They were suing their brothers and sisters in the Lord. They were rebellious. And, and Paul's teaching them on how to get out of this rebellion in relationship with Jesus Christ. And as he's teaching how to get out of this rebellion, he comes to a place and says, you need the Holy Ghost to do this. You need to realize that without the Holy Ghost, within your fleshly carnal nature, you're not going to be able to come out of this. I can preach the Word to you. I can give you instruction. I can give you direction. But if the Holy Ghost ain't behind it, you're still trying to work it out in your flesh. And how many know, without the Holy Spirit, it's all flesh and all carnality. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians, is the carnal man, the natural man, cannot understand the things of the Spirit because they must be spiritually discerned. And so Paul's trying to bring them into this relationship of spirit leadership. He goes to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and he says, but let me explain to you, if you're going to walk in these spiritual gifts, you cannot be what you used to be. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you'll see that there. Matter of fact, let me read it just so you know I'm reading from the Word of God. It says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant or unlearned. You know that you were Gentiles carried away by dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God caused Jesus a curse. He said, I don't want you to be ignorant the way you used to be. I want you to step over into this relationship with Jesus Christ and understand there's some empowerment that God wants to give to you and wants you to walk in. Right. Amen. Amen. But then he goes down and begins to identify the gifts. Now, if you skip 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, and go to 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, now that you're beginning to understand these gifts, I want you to know that you're going to begin to prophesy. And I want you all to prophesy. I want you all to speak by the Spirit the testimony of Jesus Christ. But he says, for you to understand the gifts and for you to understand prophecy, you better get this chapter down right. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And so Paul begins to express out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that our foundation is the image of God. The way we operate operates like God. Because how many know we represent God? And what is God trying to do in all of this? Restore us back to His image. Say that with me. Restore us back to His image. See, we're not talking about a Gentile world image. We're talking about a God image. Because how many know if the world can't see God in you, they'll never see God in them. They're looking for someone to represent God in a right way. God, because I remember what Matt used to look like. I remember what Brian used to do, but he's not doing that anymore. What's changed? I remember Pastor David in his drug days and cartel days and New Age days, but he's not 
that way anymore. What happened? I had an experience with Jesus Christ and an infilling of the Holy Spirit that now compels me to walk in the image of God, not the image of the world. Because Paul said, I no longer live, but Christ in me, the hope of glory. So the hope of glory is Christ's image, the weighty presence of God. Amen. How many want the weighty presence of God? So we've got to get a hold of what Paul's trying to tell us here because he's telling us we can be blessed by walking in these gifts. We can be blessed by walking in the leadership of the Holy Spirit, but we need to be cautious on how we represent those gifts. Amen? We've gone through 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 through 3, and we talked about that you can have all understanding but not have love. You're just like a bunch of noise. Verse number 2, he tells us that we could have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and knowledge, but if we don't have love, we're nothing. He tells us in the third verse, And though we bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So what is he saying here? He said, if you don't have love, you're nothing. You have no profit. And, and he also says, you're just a bunch of noise. Now, I know a bunch of Christians that are just a bunch of noise. Amen? I mean, they're great at talking, but they're terrible at walking. Come on, somebody. Am I telling the truth? You know, they claim Christ-like, they claim the image of God, but what do they do? They live like the world. And as a result, God is misrepresented, and many people are turning away from the Lord because of the misrepresentation, and they're going, why would I want to be like that? I'm already like that. (laughs) Amen. So Paul's trying to straighten some stuff out, and he goes to verse number 4, and he says, Love suffers long. And love is kind. We've already talked about love suffering long. That means you go the distance with whoever you need to go the distance representing Christ. You don't look like the world when you walk it out. You look like Christ when you walk it out. And you show that through the sufferings of Christ and through the relationship you have with Almighty God, you're willing to go whatever it takes the distance to help that person get there. Remember when I talked about this before, I talked to you about lights, camera, action. When he starts in verse number 4, when he talks about long-suffering and kindness, he's talking about the lights on you. Just imagine a spotlight shining on you. It has nothing to do with anybody else but you. This isn't about what Kathy does. This is about what Terry does. This isn't about what Mike does. This is about what Midge does. Individually, we have to consider our part. We cannot look at other people and say, I want to be like that or I don't want to be like that. No, you need to be looking at God and saying, I want to look like Him. Amen. This is about His image. This is about His representation. Amen. So the light's on you. And we talked about kindness. Kindness and dealing with kindness is when you're kind to unkind people, you're releasing an anointing. You're releasing the power of God. You're releasing the ability of God. Every time you're kind to someone that doesn't deserve kindness, but you do it anyway, there's something going on as God stretches out His hand through you. Come on, when you don't want to open the door for that person, but you choose to do it anyway, and they went, oh, they just opened the door for me. I mean, no, it changes something within the heart of the individual. Amen? We talked about kindness being the power of God, being released to a world who truly, truly needs Him. Amen? How many know we need to learn to walk in kindness? The Bible goes on and says that we should not envy. What does that really mean? It means that we need to at all times consider others equal to us. We shouldn't want what they have. We shouldn't, you know, desire them uh, what they've got for ourselves. We shouldn't be jealous. We shouldn't say, I can't believe God will do that for them, but why did He do it for me? I mean, no, that's envy. We need to realize God is no respecter of persons. If He done it for Matt, He'll do it for me. If He done it for Josh, He'll do it for me. Amen? So we need to not walk in envy. You know, it's like that person that opens up Facebook we talked about. And all they do is they see people there in the Bahamas. Did you see their chairs? And they're looking out on the water. And I'm sitting over here in Joplin, Missouri, and it's freezing cold and there's snow on the ground. I mean, no, it's envious. You need to celebrate their celebration just as much as someone else celebrates yours. Amen? That's why we have a motto here. When somebody gets blessed, what do we say? Like almost a car horn going off. What was that? 
What was it? Yeah. <laughs> or as Matt would do, wah. <laughs> Amen. How many know we can have fun in the church? Yeah. See, if you're not walking in the image of God, Paul tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that there's going to be savage, critical times that's going to come upon the earth. People are going to be self-assuming, haughty, puffed up with pride, no natural affections, lovers of self rather than lovers of God. And he tells you what to do with it. Turn away. See, we can't run with people that's turning us away from God. We've got to run with people that's turning us on to God so that we that are turned on to God can help others find Him. Amen? Amen. So the next one says, love does not parade itself. How many likes a good parade? If you've ever gone like to the Maple Leaf Parade and you see all of these different floats and you see all of the fire department and all the police department and you shoot all the Shriners. No, excuse me, I didn't say that. Um, I like the little guys too. Yeah, the little Shriners. They bring through all their little Corvettes and, you know, all that stuff. I mean, no, it, it's just a show. It's what it is. It's a show. Do you know if you've ever watched the Macy's Parade? It's a show. Amen? The Orange Bowl Parade? It's a show. Amen. It's all entertainment. And you know, the Bible says that if we're going to truly walk with God, we're not, he says, we're not to parade ourselves. Say not to. Not to. Or the scripture says does not. That means it doesn't do it. It doesn't exalt itself. It doesn't put itself on a pedestal. Amen. It's not showy. It isn't trying to make themselves visible to everybody else. Amen? Remember, we talked about lights. Now we're talking about camera. The camera's on you. What are people seeing? Because their camera's on you. They're scoping you out. They're looking to see how you're going to respond and what you're going to do with it. They're going to see what you do when somebody cusses you out or uses the name of Jesus in vain or they tell you a dirty joke to find out whether or not you're going to support it and laugh it off or just... Stand up for your beliefs. Come on, saints. We have to represent God. Amen? To parade oneself is to show to others, uh, show to, or show to others that you are in an exalted position for personal gain. Anytime you lift yourself up, you have a reason for it because you're trying to get something from someone else. Are you seeing this? This is not for your personal gain. When you accepted Jesus Christ, you died to self. That's right. Amen. You're not supposed to be live. You're supposed to be dead, living for Christ. Amen. Amen. Let me show you a couple examples I think is really good. Mark chapter 1 and verse number 40 through 44. Uh, Jesus himself was a great example to not exalt himself. And how many know he had every right to exalt himself? I mean, he's the son of the living God. But look what he says. It's now, now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleaned. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way. Show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. What was Jesus' number one response? Don't run around and tell everybody what I did. Go to the priest... And show yourself to the priest because this is what's been organized or set up by God. And Jesus wanted to always follow what God wanted, not what he wanted. Are you seeing this? Well, look what happened in verse 45, which is interesting. Because this is what happened because of what they did. He says, however, he went out and began to proclaim it freely. And spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. Because he wasn't willing to, to do what Jesus called him to do, but he decided he was going to exalt Jesus and put him on a pedestal and make him seen to everybody, Jesus himself said that he couldn't even go back into the city openly without being thronged by the people. Are you seeing this? See, Jesus is trying to help us understand it's not about you. Amen? 
Mark chapter 20, or Matthew 23, verses 1 through 7. Let's look at that. Matthew chapter 23. said that Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and they do not do it. For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. What was the religious leaders wanting? Look at me. But even though they're telling everybody else what to do, they weren't doing it themselves. Here they're trying to put themselves up on a pedestal. Here they're trying to show themselves off. And Jesus uses them an example and says, you know, don't do what they do. Because they tell you what to do, but they themselves don't even do it. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge their borders of their garments. They love the best places at feast and the best seats in the synagogue, greeting in the marketplaces, and to be called rabbi or teachers. Are you seeing this? They're looking for a position. Saints, if you're looking for a position, you're in the wrong place. Amen? God raises up. God takes down. God uses whoever He wants. If He wants to use a donkey, He'll use a donkey. Amen? Because God is looking for humble people that are willing to serve Him and to honor Him and reflect Him everywhere they go. He's not looking for religious people to go, Man, did you see the size of my church? Do you see how many people's coming to my church? You ought to see my offering last week. I mean, no, they're exalting themselves. And Jesus is telling, or Paul's telling us in this chapter, do not parade yourself. Don't do it. Amen. Look at verse 12. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus is telling us, if you want to go high, you've got to go low. But if you want to make yourself high, get ready to go low. <laughs> Amen? Because God says He raises up the humble and He takes down the, the proud. Amen? Matthew 20, verse 28. I've got a lot of scriptures for you now because I really want you to get this. Matthew 20, 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. Who's our example? Jesus Christ. And what did he say? He said, I came not to be served, but to serve. You know, when you are in an exalted position, you're wanting to be served. But when you're in a humble position, you're in a position to serve. And what is the purpose? Jesus just showed you for the benefit of everybody else. We've got to learn, saints, that we're here for him. If we can't learn this, we're going to miss out on a lot that's getting ready to happen in these last days. I'm telling you, the former and latter rain of the Holy Ghost is getting ready to pour out. The harvest is coming in. And let me tell you what, you're either going to cause people to come in or you're going to cause people to stay out. And that's serious stuff. Amen? Amen? So what did he do? He came to what? To serve. See, to parade, some, to parade yourself around is self-exaltation. It's the promotion of you, not the promotion of God. Amen? Um, If you're drawing attention to yourself and not to the needs of what God wants, that's parading itself. You know, are you doing it for your benefit or are you doing it for His benefit? Everything I do in prayer isn't so that I can learn more and be closer to God and have all the benefits of God. My prayer life is about knowing you and being on a course that you want me on to help others. You know, I could sit around and talk about all my needs to God all day long and pray about all my needs and make it all about me. And saints, when I I accepted Christ, I, I no longer have to worry about what God needs to do for me because God said He takes care of all my need according to His riches and glory. Since I have switched over to His way of doing, He takes care of my way of doing. I'm no longer trying to work in relationship with God. I'm living in relationship with God. And in living in relationship with somebody, now you feel comfortable to where you can actually take that relationship and help others find it as well. 
It's no longer works. It's no longer me trying to work it up and trying to testify it up and trying to go out and do all these things. You know, I'm walking with God and God's walking with me and everywhere I go, I want people to see him. I want them to see him, not me. Amen. Amen. He says, does not parade itself. Amen. Does not draw attention to himself, but draws attention to God. So ask yourself, are you drawing attention to God everywhere you go? Amen. Amen. That, that would be my hope too. Amen. As a Christian, my number one focus is what Jesus told us to do. To love God with all my heart, all my strength, and all my soul. And to love my neighbor as myself. He didn't tell me to love myself. <laughs> he told me to love them as I would love myself. You know. I'm so in love with me. That's the way a lot of Christians are, man. They're just all over themselves. Oh, you're so good. You're so cute. You're so beautiful. Oh, look at you today. You weren't told to love yourself. Try it. Put your arms around yourself and start doing this and see how much, how much fun it is. <laughs> We're not told to love ourselves. We're told to love God and to love one another. So if we're going to love God and love one another, and he says love does not parade itself, does not exalt itself, does not put itself upon a pedestal, it's time for some of us to come off and get down where we're supposed to be. Amen? Amen? Amen. Look at John chapter 13, verse number 35. John chapter 13, verse number 35. By this all will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for yourself, Oh, come on. I mean, don't you like that? No, you have love one for another. Amen. Look at John, 1 John 4. 1 John 4, verses 7 through 16. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. Huh. He does not know God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that He might live through Him. In this, lo- in, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son in, in to be the perpetuation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. So he sent his son so that we might be reconciled to God, so that we could know the love of God, and that we could know the love of Christ, and that we could walk in the love one for another. That was the call that was placed upon our lives when we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Amen? You know, our, our, our really... Relationship with God is to help bring people out of slavery to false loves. Everybody wants to be loved. Who doesn't want to be loved? Everybody wants to be loved, and everybody's looking for love. But the problem with the world is, is they're seeing it in all the wrong places. What's worse than that is they say they're coming to church, but they're not being loved. They're being escorted out. They're being told what to do and what not to do. They're giving them the law instead of the love of Christ. Amen. We need we need to love the way God wants to love. Let me let me share a few examples with you. That's uh, I'm just going to go through them, John. I don't think you have to pull them all up. But uh, and and I'll go ahead and pull up Philippians two. I think this is important. You see that Philippians two five through eight. So this, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. So he's saying you need to think like this. 
who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal to God or with God, but made himself of what? A person that parades themselves is looking for a reputation. Taken on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him. Remember, you humble yourself, God lifts you up. Highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, and those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and the glory of, the, of God and the Father. Do you see what he said? He says, because of this love, because of this humility, because he didn't exalt himself, God said that he raised him up into an exalted position so that others could come in. Amen. See, God wants to raise you up, but he wants to raise you up to the obedience of him so that when you represent him, others will come into the saving grace of Christ. Amen? But remember, he'll take down the proud and raise up the Right. You know, Jesus' love was so great for us that he laid his life down in baptism. Come on. He goes to John, and what's John baptizing with? Water of repentance. Well, Jesus had nothing to repent for. Jesus could have went down there and go, you know, John, you don't have to do this. You know, I'm the Son of God, and I've got no sin in me. And so... I'm just going to ignore this and then I'm just going to go off and do what God wants me to do. No, Jesus himself humbled himself under the water of repentance and allowed a man to baptize a non-sinner so that he could come up and fulfill the things of God. Jesus knew that he had to do this to fulfill uh, the prophecies of the Old Testament. Jesus knew that he had to do this to set an example to you and me so that we would not exalt ourselves in the kingdom of God. Amen? Jesus' love was so powerful that when He went it to the cross, He did it without a word. He could have said a lot. I watched a show last night uh, called um, um, After the Resurrection. And it was an Old Testament show that did modern day teaching in how when Peter and John was filled with the Holy Spirit and came down to Gate Beautiful and laid hands upon the man and said, Silver and gold I have not but what I have. They did nothing but scriptures through this whole thing, all the way through Peter, John, uh, Saul that became Paul, you know, Ananias that laid hands upon. And I'm telling you what, you talking about humble men, when, 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 when Peter stood up to tell them about the death of Jesus Christ, he's choking on his words. They killed the Messiah. Even though he knew the power, even he knew the anointing that he had, even though he's seen people healed and delivered, he was so humbled because of the loss of something that broke his heart that he saw Jesus had to go through. Saints, I don't think that we really understand what Jesus went through and we just make him a common name instead of realizing the death, burial, and resurrection that he had to go through. I mean, he did this so that we could walk in the love of God. Amen? Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 10, 1 and 2, he said that he pleaded with meekness and gentleness to the people. He didn't go in there and go, get right or get left, get saved, heaven or hell, up or down, in or out, cold or hot. <laughs> that ain't what he preached. He preached pleading meekness and gentleness to the people. Acts 20 verse 31 said, he cried out. He literally had tears coming out of his eyes crying out for people to accept Christ. He wasn't looking for an exalted position. He was looking for people to get exalted by Christ. 2 Corinthians 12, 5 through 9, he said that when he cried out and said he had the thorn in his side, he cried out three times and God kept telling him, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. He could have stood up and said, God, look at all these things I've been doing for you. How come you haven't responded? Don't you see that I'm hurting in my side? No, he didn't do that at all. He cried out to God and God said, Paul, my grace, my ability is sufficient for you. You study it out. What was the thorn? Many thought that it might have been a speech impediment. Some thought it might be an eye. Some thought it might be a bodily injury because he got beaten and shipwrecked and boiled and all sorts of stuff, stoned and left for dead. No, his impairment, according to Scripture, was people. Paul basically is saying, God, take these people away from me because I'm tired of them. And God said, my grace is to handle all this. So to walk in love, you have God's grace on it. 
because this is God working in you. Amen? Paul says in Ephesians, he said, matter of fact, I love it because he said, I'm the least of the least of all the saints. What did he say? He said, you can make me a doormat. And if it helps someone get across to the other side, it was worth them walking over the top of me. See, Paul set the example. Peter set the example. 1 Peter 5, 1. Peter said, I'm a fellow elder and a witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not, I am Peter and upon this rock. Come on, saints. Love does not parade itself. Revelation 1 9 says that that John he said when he saw Jesus he said uh, uh, I, I'm your I'm your brother your companion in the resurrection of Jesus Christ he didn't say I'm John the revelator and I'm getting ready to write the whole revelation no he humbled himself amen what is the difference between a person who is is not um, parading themselves is it's the difference between humility and pride are you seeing this? Um, Mark chapter 9 verse 35 says, If you desire to be first, you need to realize you're really last. If you're trying to position yourself. Pride is looking for glory. Pride is looking to show off. Matter of fact, one of the scholars said that pride not, not only is, is a root, but it means to be mean-spirited. When you're, when you're in pride, you're mean-spirited. You're angry. You're lashing out. You're saying things that you shouldn't. You want to know where all of this comes from? It comes from Satan and pride to exalt himself because he wants what he wants and he's going to get it the way he wants it. Is this helping anybody tonight? Because saints, we've got to imitate Christ. We've got to show the world how great he is. Amen? Paul said in 1 Timothy verses 1, 13 and 15, he said, Jesus came to save the sinners. And he said, oh, and by the way, I'm the chief sinner. <laughs> That's humility. He's not exalting himself. Peter at the, at, the, at the temple where they said, silver and gold I have not, what I have I give unto you. And he went before the Sanhedrin and they began to question him. And you know, it's really amazing because he said this, why do you marvel at us? Turn to the Lord and see him. I mean, they could have exalted themselves. Oh, yeah, I was the one that laid hands upon him. Oh, you should have seen it. Remember what happened when the disciples went out and he blew the breath of the Holy Spirit upon them? And they went out and they came back and said, boy, I mean, we laid hands on the sick. We cast out devils. And even the demons were subject to us. And Jesus immediately came back and didn't go, that's a great job, guys. No, he came back and said, hey, be careful. Just remember this. Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and that's all you need to know. Amen? Humility defends others, even when they're not worth defending, according to you. You defend others. You don't fault find. You don't criticize. Amen? Remember what happened when Miriam began to get onto Moses and said, I cannot believe that you married that Ethiopian black woman. Well, you know what happened? She was trying to take a position over Moses and God showed up. And when God showed up, gave her leprosy and Moses cried out. He didn't go, you deserve that, Mary, and you should have never said anything about my wife. No. He cried out and said, God, don't kill her with this. And God said, I'll put her out of the, out of the camp for seven days and then I'll take the leprosy off and bring her back in. Moses knew not to exalt himself but knew to walk in humility because it, it meant the salvation of his sister. Are you seeing this? Amen. See, we must understand that what we do affects others. We've got to see this. If you don't get anything else out of this sermon tonight, what you do affects others. It's either going to send them to heaven or send them to hell. And we need to really take this seriously. Amen? Amen. Luke 6, 27 through 36. You can write that down and please look at it later. 1 John 4, 8, he who does not love does not know God. Ephesians 4, 2 and 3 talked about being gentle and patience, bearing with one another in love. Colossians 3, 12 through 16 says, clothe yourself in love. When you get up in the morning, put love on. Amen? 
See, you know what pride does? It's always looking for that pat on the back. Uh huh. Having, you know, a high opinion of themselves. Humility accepts his faults and weaknesses and tries to correct it. Pride doesn't see his faults and weaknesses. You know, have you ever seen that person that's done wrong and you know they've done wrong, but they won't tell you they've done wrong because as far as they're concerned, they're right? You better, better be careful because through pride, the devil fell and took a third of the angels out of heaven. From that caused the human race to fall because the devil convinced Eve that she could be like God. When we walk outside, uh, when we walk without humility and walk in pride, we're exalting ourselves above God. Hello? I like what um, Jonathan Edwards and C.S. Lewis said this. He said, when we walk in pride, we walk in anger, greed, drunkenness, and everything else that goes with it. And he says, if that's not bad enough, it's an anti-God spirit state of mind. Anti-God spirit of mind. Whew, that's serious. Amen? Pride likes to justify why it does it, what it does. Well, I did this because you deserve that. I did this because I was trying to help you. <laughs> I said that because I knew you needed it. <laughs> Hello? We've got to speak what God says, not what you think. <laughs> Never Remember uh, Peter on the boat? Jesus is sleeping. Storm comes. He turns and says, says matter of fact it starts out peter's got the got the stern he's going i got this i can handle this and then all of a sudden he stops and realizes the storm's bigger than him and he turns to jesus and says don't you care so we do we think we got it let me tell you what i got nothing except his leadership I have nothing except a relationship with him and sharing out of that relationship what he expects me to walk in according to his plan for my life. That's all I have. When I go to preach, I told my wife tonight because I had a long day and struggled in a lot of stuff. And I thought, man, I'm just, I'm just running and I just hope I've got what I need to preach to you guys tonight. And I remember the Lord saying, are you going to walk in humility or pride? If you walk in pride, you're going to say you got it. If you walk in humility, I got something to work with. Are you enjoying it so far? Amen. Amen. Remember the story in 2 Chronicles 26 with Uzziah? He's 16 years of age. He has been exalted to a position of a king. Because his father had died and he took on the position. And look what it says in uh, 2 Chronicles 26.5. This is so good. He says, He sought God in the days of Zechariah who had understanding in the visions of God. And, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Yes, 16 years of age, he knew. Follow the prophet. Follow what God is saying. So God begins to exalt him. Man, God provides provision, provides kingdoms, provides armies, provides staff, provides all this stuff for Uzziah. I mean, the kid is just blessed. Amen. But then it says in chapter 26, verse 15, just a few verses later, and he made devices in Jerusalem invented by skillful men to be on the towers and the corners to shoot arrows and large stones. So his fame spread far and wide for he was marvelously helped till he became strong but when he was strong his heart was lifted up to his destruction for he transgressed against the lord his god by entering the temple of the lord to burn incense on the altar of incense what did he do he got his eyes off of the one that raised him up saints god can take you down but he would rather raise you up. I mean, saints, there's going to be some blessings that's going to come. There's going to be some things that God's going to provide for you. There's going to be some supernatural things as this harvest begins to happen. God's going to begin to bless. God's going to begin to multiply. And God's going to begin to do 
be careful. Because just as fast as He raised you up, He'll take you right on back down. Amen? What happened? What happened to Uzziah? He quit seeking the Lord. And because he quit seeking the Lord, he lost everything he had. The Bible says in Proverbs 11, 2, pride brings shame. So here you are, you're in a great place, God's doing great things, and all of a sudden you start thinking a little bit more about yourself. And guess what? Shame will cause you to fail and feel inadequate, to, even to the point where the enemy will deceive you and say, you're not a child of God. Because what caused it? Pride. Proverbs 16, 18, pride comes with destruction because of a haughty spirit. Amen. I mean, don't, don't you think we need to hear this stuff? Amen. Everyone who exalts himself is humbled. Everyone who is humbled is exalted. Because think about this. Pride, pride is an attitude of self-sufficiency. It's an attitude of self-importance and self-exaltation. That's what pride is. C.S. Lewis said pride is like a cancer and it eats up everything around it, especially love. Amen. Especially love. And he also said, and I thought this was good, he said pride will put a target on your back and God knows how to shoot. <laughs> I mean, no, he knows how to shoot. Amen? Yes. So, ask yourself tonight, do you have pride? What do you do when somebody snubs you? What do you do when somebody doesn't say hello? What do you do when somebody does something opposite of what you want and you get irritated? Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Pride. Let me introduce you to yourself. Are you seeing this? It's wicked. Pride is wicked. Amen? Amen? Amen. Do you compare yourself with other people? Yes. You know, they're looking really good, and you didn't quite put on enough makeup. Amen? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to talk about you, man. <laughs> or, you know, you know, I mean, you turn on the television, and it's Christian. And there's a man standing up there that's got tattoos all over his body talking about Jesus. And you go, I can't believe they're doing that. Hello, pride. It's true. You didn't like their music. Hello, pride. I didn't like the way they talked with an accent. Hello, pride. Who are you to determine what you like and don't like? We're all in the image of God, and we all have different things that we do, and we all have different ways of, of showing that. But the reality is, is we're not trying to exalt ourselves; We're trying to exalt Him. And when you're trying to do it your way and not His way, you have just walked yourself right into pride. I'm telling you, God's telling us here, we want to walk in power, we want to walk in prophecy, we better get a hold of this love chapter. We haven't even gotten into all the other things I'm about to talk to you about over these next several weeks. Right now, we're just talking about exaltation. We're talking about pride. Amen? I mean, it's okay to be proud of your child, isn't it? It's okay to be proud of a sports team that, that won. It's okay to see accomplishments because we should be proud of those who are trying to achieve good things. But it's when it exalts itself is when we get into trouble. There's only one we're supposed to exalt. Amen? The Greek word... For humility is the word tapenos, T-A-P-E-I-N-O-S. And do you know what that word really means? It means to have a right view. Humility is to have a right view. A right view of God, a right view of yourself, and a right view of others. Say right view. Scriptures to write down, Matthew 12, 3 through 21. You should need to read them. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. 
Philippians 2, 3 and 4. Do you know what humility really does? Listen to this. This was so good because it's so true. When I read this, I really took it into my spirit. Humility increases our hunger for God's word. Humility opens our hearts to God's spirit. Hallelujah. You okay, sister? Amen. And when you walk in humility, it leads you into more intimacy with God. Why? Because when you're humble in the presence of God, it makes you realize how much more of Him you really need. But when you're in pride, you don't need any more from God. 1 Peter 5, 6. There's another one you need to write down. And I'm going to close on this. How do you know that you're walking in pride versus wisdom or humility? I'm going to show, going to show you some stuff here. Pride talks. Humility asks questions. If you've got a person that's just constantly doing this, And you can't get a word in? Hello, pride. Pride already knows. Humility's still learning. Hmm. Pride, I have all I need. Humility says, oh, I just want to learn more. Pride says, I don't need help from others. Humility says, oh, I need all the help I can get. Yeah. Pride judges. But humility is open and vulnerable because it realizes the need. Pride broadcast. Humility explores, continually looks. Pride has all the gospel truths. Humility says, there's so much more I need to learn. Is this helping anybody tonight? Amen. You remember the story in Luke chapter 18, verse 9 through 14? I'm going to read it real quick. If you'll put that up, Luke 18, 9 through 14, I think this is worth seeing. The difference between the Pharisee and the tax collector that is now beginning ready to stand before God. Okay? Luke 18, 9 through 14. Oh, we could think of more people. I mean, think about the prodigal son that went off and was with the pigs. Daddy could have said, he was with the pigs. We don't even do pigs in our house. And Daddy could have said, no way, you ain't coming home to my place. But Daddy opened his arms and said, come on back. Why? Because his son came back in humility. But there was another side of the coin, and that was a brother that was prideful and said, I can't believe you let him back in the house. You're still giving him all our inheritance, and I've been here all along pride right he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves trusted what that they were righteous and despised other two men went up to the temple to pray one a pharisee the other a tax collector the pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself god i thank you that i am not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even tax collectors. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing off from afar, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. What an example. Listen to this. The Pharisee trusted himself. The tax collector trusted God. The Pharisees seized the contempt that others carry. But the tax collector saw the grace of the sin he carried. The, the, the Pharisees praised himself. The tax collector praised God. The Pharisee says, I've got no sin. Look at all I've done. But the tax collector said, oh, I'm full of sin. The Pharisee says, 
I'm not even going to thank God for this because I've done this. But the tax collector said, he did it. The Bible says love does not. Put it this way. Pastor David does not parade himself. Pastor Linda does not parade itself. Sister Cindy does not parade itself. Put your name there. This is what you have to look at tonight. Because if you are exalting yourself, I promise you, you're about to come down. Because when His Word goes forth, and you know His Word, and you choose not to follow His Word, Remember, you've got a target on your back. And God says, I take down the proud and I raise up the humble. Amen? The Pharisees were self-dependent. The tax collector was God-dependent. The Pharisee was self-righteous. The tax collector was Christ-righteous. Which are you? Father, I thank you tonight for your word. I'm so humbled in your presence just to be even stand up here and share what you've given us tonight. And God, I know that each and every one of these are righteous, holy men and women of God desiring to please you. And I ask to the sound of my voice that every person in this place and every person online say, Holy Spirit, help me not to exalt myself, but exalt you. I know there's areas in my life that I am self-exalted and I repent and I ask you convict my heart from this day forward so when people see me they will see you. In Jesus' name. Can we give God some praise tonight? There's so much more I wanted to share. There's so many more scriptures I wanted to get into. There was Because it's all the way through scripture. Amen. All the way through scripture. From the very beginning all the way to the end. Because we know that in the end there's going to be one called the Antichrist that's going to exalt himself. But I'm telling you what. There's an hour coming where he's going to be taken down. He does not win. Much as he thinks he's got a, got a handle on this. His day's coming. And judgment will. He's got a target on his back. And let me tell you what, saints, as long as we are walking and, and not parading ourselves, I'm telling you what, we're walking with the power of God and we're going to target those that are walking with a target and bring them into the kingdom because we're going to show them a different spirit. Amen? We're going to show them a Joshua spirit, a Caleb spirit that knows that no matter what it looks like out there, even though they look like we're grasshoppers and they're giants in the land, we're going out with the power of God that is more than able to carry us through. Whew, come on, somebody. And I encourage you online tonight that if you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I would, accept, I would, I would ask you to do so tonight. You say, well, how do I do this? I've got so many problems. I've got so many issues. Yield and give your heart to Him. Yeah. And let Him come in, and He'll help you. Because, saints, I'm telling you, you can't do this without Him. I was messed up, drugs, alcohol, immorality, into pornography, into drugs, into new age, even got into a cult for eight and a half years. But the day when I opened up my heart and I allowed Jesus to come in, because I will tell you this, every denomination will kill you, but Christ is the only thing that will save you. I don't care what name they put on the title of their church or what, what, what cult that they might be in, the only way to truly come out of all of it, including the world, is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And when you open up your heart, what you're saying is, Lord, come in and sup with me and take over my life. And when you do, you're not only Savior, but you're Lord of my life. And when you're Lord of my life, that means you lead and I follow. And then ask Him to fill you with the Holy Ghost. And I promise you, your life will never be the same. We love you, and I pray that you'll take that seriously, and you'll spend some time with Him. It's not a religious call. It's not taking you through some sinner's prayer. Even though we can do that, the reality is you get real with God, and God will get real with you. We love you, and we look forward to seeing you next week.